Can Ashton Parish Church this morning. Welcome, especially if you're a visitor to our congregation. I know we've got at least one visitor from the USA today. So welcome to David's mum, uh, who is with us worshipping this morning. Uh, welcome for all who will be watching online and those who will watch at some part point later on during the week. This is the fifth Sunday of Easter. Easter's not just one day, it is a season. Um, and today, obviously, is the Sunday of the coronation. Did you enjoy watching the coronation yesterday? Yes. It was quite something, was it not? <clears throat> um, we'll come back to that in due course, possibly. So let us come before God as we gather as a congregation this morning of God's people in worship and praise. We start our service as we always do with our gathering song from Fishy Music. Callum's going to lead us. It's welcome everybody, it's good to see you here. Welcome everybody, it's good to see you here. Welcome everybody, it's good to see you here. Gathering in this place. We stand to sing if you're able. Welcome everybody, it's good to see you here. Welcome everybody, it's good to see you here. Welcome everybody, it's good to see you here. Gathering in this place. Welcome everybody, it's good to see you here. Welcome everybody. It's good to see you here, gathering in this place. Please take a moment to say good morning to one another. Feel free to move around. Um, the intimations are as follows, hopefully. Um, the service next Sunday will be held at the usual time of 10 o'clock. There will be tea and coffee fellowship in the Iron Hall after service. Can I remind you there is tea and coffee fellowship this morning. We also have cake. We have a lot of cake. We are caked out, you could say. So please do come and share afterwards for tea and coffee for special coronation cakes. <coughs> I expected more excitement about that. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe we'll get you. Maybe we'll get more excited in a minute when we look at them. But that is service next Sunday. Also, um, I, Tony and I are on holiday as of this afternoon. Um, so if you need any contact, first of all, the first port of contact is Jim, and then obviously Anne as well. Anne is covering for any uh, uh, pastoral um, things that need to be seen to during my absence for the next two weeks. Audiovisual team, since the pandemic, the audiovisual team obviously were relying a lot on the screens, as you can see. We also broadcast live on Facebook and it goes up on a YouTube channel as well. Um, did you know we had a YouTube channel? Well, there you go. Um, so the small team who run the gallery are looking to strengthen their numbers um, to improve resilience. I love that phrase. I read that last week. I thought, that's well written. I like that, John. That's really good. If you'd like to increase their resilience um, and learn what it's involved in, please speak to either Alison, John, or Billy for further details as soon as possible. Soup and sandwich lunches continue on the 10th and 24th of May in the Cumbria Hall. That's this Wednesday coming. 
This Wednesday is lunch at 12.30, and the 24th is worship at 12, with lunch at 12.30. Again, Margaret's looking for some volunteers with that. Third Good at Boys Brigade are holding their 113th annual inspection and display in the church on Friday the 12th of May. Chief Guest and Inspecting Officer this year will be the um, at Second Good at Boys Brigade Captain Alan Aitken, MBE, and a warm welcome is extended to all friends of the Third Guruk to come along and join the fun. It was a brilliant time last year, so please do come and support the BB um, at their display this week on Friday. Remind you that the Dementia Cafe is still open on Fridays from 2 to 3.30 and all will be made most welcome. Please feel free to come along. And I wonder if anybody else, has anybody got any good news today? No, did you know that today is World Laughter Day? <laughs> See, you laughed at that, didn't you? That's quite funny, isn't it? You laughed at World Laughter Day. So anybody know any good jokes? <laughs> anybody can tell the church. <laughs> yeah, okay, let's move on from that quickly. Just in case. So I've got some good news. It's Gail White's birthday today. I've got it written here. Susie, thank you for the note. Today is Gail's birthday. Yay! <laughs> so, happy birthday, Gail. Hope you have a great day. And um, we, as we normally do, so if I can call upon Callum, please thank you if you wouldn't mind. You know what to play. That sounds about right. a special concert down at Windsor for you today, so congratulations and enjoy. <laughs> so, here we are. Any future intimations, can you please get them to news at ogachurch.org.uk by noon on Thursday so they can be included in the intimations. Here we are on this Sunday of the coronation. Our nation changed and we move forward. So these are the cakes we've got, by the way. Uh, you want to go back one? Can we knit back one just quickly? So you've got that one. you got that one. Next one. Yay, not bad, eh? So we've got them through, so please do come and eat. We've got a lot of cakes. Did I mention there's cakes? <laughs> yeah, the car, the smell in the car coming back from Costco yesterday was overwhelming. <laughs> I nearly had to stop twice in the M8. <laughs> We come before God on this day to remember the coronation of King Charles III that took place yesterday. It was quite a spectacle, and quite an amazing spectacle. You'll probably figure there's a theme running through this this morning and through the hymns. So we're going to sing Junior Praise 289, Who is the King of the Jungle? It was, uh, can you put the verse on for me? Thanks. So uh, yeah, it's just one quote, it's just one verse, isn't it? So it's, who's the king of the jungle? Who's the king of the, the sea? Who's the king of the universe? And who's the king of me? I tell you, G-E-S-U-S is, he's the king of me. He's the king of the universe, the jungle, and the sea. So normally at the end, of the king of, who's the king of the jungle? We decided that last time we sang this, that we'd do something different. So it goes, who's the king of the jungle? And we go, you don't remember. <laughs> well, seen you're not elephants. <laughs> who's the king of the jungle? <laughs> We do that, we try that, we go that one, two. Who's the king of the jungle? It's <laughs> a bit pathetic, isn't it? We'll try again. Who's the king of the jungle? <laughs> That's better. Okay, we'll sing it through twice, I think, if we stand to sing together. Who's the king of the jungle? <laughs>
the king of the jungle. Who, so we now have a king. We've moved from Queen Elizabeth II to King Charles III. And the ancient rite of, of coronation took place yesterday. In fact, you can even see the king is now coronated. <laughs> I'm still using that word. I like it. And particularly it was important. What did they put on his did When you watched yesterday, what struck you about it? When you were watching it, what was the most important bit for you? The fact it was raining. <laughs> they were getting wet. Do you see all the soldiers on parade with their busbies? Do you see them when they took them off though, the water falling from them? <laughs> Can't say, but weight in their heads must be quite something. But what was the most impressive bit? I thought one of the most impressive bits was when the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, who's normally quite a quiet guy, pronounced God save the king. Good grief, I nearly jumped to that. <laughs> Did you hear it? Uh, there was no doubt about it, was there? But it was actually quite, quite something. And of course, what did they put on the king's head? What did they put on the king's head? We still talk about the top of her head being a crown. A crown. I got my hair cut this week, don't really notice. <laughs> but I'm feeling I'm getting bald over the day, but never mind anyway. So we got a crown and luckily um, not, do we, not only do we have not only do we have these two cakes you saw. But we've got our very own. I'm not sure how to do this. Anybody oh. fancy being crowned? <laughs> so I thought I could wait. I thought I could. Oh. No, that's not. <laughs> that's not a good idea. But I thought one of the most powerful images was as he was present, King Charles was presented with all the symbolic things to do with state, the sword and the orb and the scepters, and then the crown being placed in his head. It's such a symbolic moment that that is a sign of kingship, the sign that he's our king and Queen Camilla, the fact that they shared in the crown. I must admit, I did have a smile to myself with the look in Camilla's face as she was suddenly faced with the Archbishop of Canterbury standing over her. But the joy in her face as well was quite wonderful to see. But it also must be a tinge with sadness because the only reason that Charles is king is because his mum passed away. So there must be a sadness there as well, but also a pride. And that idea, that moment when the crown was placed on his head, it must be uncomfortable to wear but he bore it with great, great resilience, I thought, yesterday. But also the symbolism of it really is quite something. This has been made by Gillian over here. So, um, I <laughs> Can I just say it's very heavy and I, don't, I feel guilty. I, you'd feel guilty cutting this, wouldn't you? Yes. It looks fantastic. And we remind ourselves that we are part of the United Kingdom, we're part of one country, we're part of a nation that has a king, and that king and the monarchy are there as part of the symbols of our state. And that's what we're going to be thinking about this morning. But also what I thought, just briefly, I'm going to put this down just in case. I wonder if you were king or queen for the day, what's the one thing you'd want to do? If you were king or queen for the day, what's one thing you'd want to do? Any ideas? Just one day. Just one Just day. One day. <laughs> I'm only limiting it to one day. I'm not giving you any more space than that. What would you do? If you were king or queen for the day, what would you want to do? Yeah, the second goal was offside. <laughs> 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 there, there, there speaks to this, an unhappy Tim Morton fan. What would you want to do? If you'd all, suddenly all, I mean, the, the thing is, King Charles doesn't really, he's got power, but not a lot of power, it's more symbolic. But if you're a king who had a lot of power, what's the one thing you'd want to do? Would you want to do something that's for yourself? Like, I don't know, free Burger King for the year, for the <laughs> I don't know. Or a free season ticket for any football club you may want to go to. Or making sure your team won the league. 
by decree, <coughs> take away any doubt? I don't know. I, I would hope that what we would want to do is something that would help people and change people. And I think one of the most important things that we saw in the coronation yesterday was what Charles wanted to do with his kingship, which is to serve. That's key. That's the important thing. So as we think about what it would like to be king for the day or queen for the day, what that power would actually do, well, I wonder if we'd end up doing something good or maybe we'd think, well, maybe do something for ourselves. <laughs> but at the end of the day, the key thing is what, we want, what our king wants to do and hopefully what the church is there to do is to serve. And that's what we're going to think about this morning. Serving. Serving. So, and when you go through afterwards, you'll be served. Cake. <laughs> so please do come through and share after the service. I'm going to lead us in prayer as we share together in our time. Let us join our hearts in prayer, at the end of which we will say the Lord's Prayer together. Let us pray. Great God, you ride upon the clouds and the earth shakes before you. You protect the vulnerable, comfort the suffering, and lead the oppressed to freedom. You are the king of glory and ruler of all things. You give strength to all. And with your people through all generations, we come with joy to acclaim you, our God, and exalt you as Lord of all. We praise you with all of creation, trusting in your mercy and recognizing your great humility. For in Jesus Christ, you came among humankind as one of us. He is our Prince of Peace, King of love, Lord of life. His greatness is shown to ordinary people in acts of gracious service, healing ills, restoring life, washing feet. And you invite us to share Christ's everlasting life and follow his example of selfless dedication to you and loving our neighbors without limit. Yet too often we long for reward or recognition and we fail to live as you command. But you do not abandon us, and so we turn to you again, trusting that in your great love you forgive us. O God, who is king above all gods, you call us to worship you with joy and serve your purposes throughout the earth. Renew us by your Spirit's lively working, that our worship may be glad and grateful. God of might, creating and sustaining all things, God of mercy present among us. We praise you in the name of your Son, who taught us to pray as together we say the prayer he taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We're going to sing together from Junior Praise. Well, it's not really from Junior Praise. I couldn't find it in Junior Praise. It's in Junior Praise, isn't it? Yeah. Joy is a flag flying high. If you notice, when um, the king or queen are, is in residence, there is a special flag, the royal standard, that flies above whichever palace they're in. Yesterday it was flying high above Buckingham Palace. Um, so it's, it's the, there's a flag flying high. Can we go into the first verse, thanks? So there, there is a flag flying high. So there is a flag flying high from the castle of my heart. From the castle of my heart, the castle of my heart. There is a flag flying high from the castle of my heart, for the king is in residence there. Okay? And then it goes, so let it fly in the sky, let the whole world know. It's like a Mexican wave. We'll see how we go. Let's stand together and sing. There is a flag flying high.
northeast of Scotland in a mission church uh, years and years ago, and then it was so modern. And now it seems quite not so modern, but it's still got that joy to it. And on this World Laughter Day, did I mention it was World Laughter Day? Yes. Good. <laughs> it's important to remember the joy that this week also that this also represents, or the joy that we should feel. So. It's a wonderful hymn. I do enjoy singing it. So let's come before God as we share together in the reading of his word. Our first reading this morning is taken from the Gospel of Matthew. I'm reading Matthew chapter 22, verses 15 to 22. This is a reality of, of the tension, I suppose, of church and state that we saw in evidence yesterday. Um, where the church, obviously it was a very religious service. Um, indeed, I was greatly loved, if you're watching it, greatly loved the gospel choir that sang. They were very impressive in the Alleluia. And also the new song that was produced by Andrew Lloyd Webber. Um, I'm assuming we'll get to sing that soon, or at least the choir will. <laughs> <laughs> we'll wait and see. Uh, so let's hear these words. From Matthew's Gospel, Matthew chapter 22, verses 15 to 22. Paying taxes to Caesar. Then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap Jesus in his words. They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Teacher, they said, we know you are a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by men, because you pay no attention to who they are. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, You hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying the tax. They brought him a denarius, and he asked them, Whose portrait is this, and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then he said to them, Give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. When they heard this, they were amazed. So they left him and went away. Amen. We are going to remain seated and sing Mission Praise 454. Majesty. We're going to sing it through uh, just a couple of times. Majesty.
turn to read now from God's Word, and we hear from 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 to 13. This is the idea of the capstone of the central stone, and the image of that stone that's been given is of Jesus. So Jesus described as the living stone and being central to the whole reality of life. So we hear these words in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verses 4 to 13. The living stone and the chosen people. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by men but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are built are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone, and a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Amen. And thanks be to God for these readings from his holy word, and to his name be all the praise and the glory. We stand and sing together from CH4, hymn 160, Praise my soul, the King of heaven.
Son and Holy Spirit, one God, one with the end. Amen. It was quite magnificent yesterday, and no matter what your views on monarchy, you cannot fail to be impressed by the sheer scale of the pomp and circumstance. Many will point to the cost of such an event. They think it's about 77 million. But it makes a statement, I suppose, of our identity. And one thing that it has done since the death of Queen Elizabeth II is there have been increasing questions of the role of the monarchy in a modern democracy. We know we have got different views on monarchy. Indeed, I would say this time probably there's a greater upsurge in people voicing anti monarchy feeling wanting a republic than any time that I can remember and it's important that all voices are heard because we are a democracy and of course one of the things about um, the role of the, king, the, the monarchy is how much power does the monarch actually have and how does the monarchy go forward in a modern age there are different models, as I say. I was watching a programme during the week, and one of the models is the Dutch monarchy. The Dutch monarchy, who recently had King's Day, I understand, where the king arrived on the royal bus. Electric. At least they, wasn't, they have bicycles to go around in a bike. Some of the other royal families have also, there's also talking about slimming down the monarchy, although I believe Princess Anne talked about that in an interview in the States and indicated that she didn't want to be slimmed down. <laughs> and the reality of the monarchy, the role that they have, they see them, the monarchy is seen now almost as a firm. They talk about themselves as a firm and we hear talk about uh, working royals because of the image and the, the role that they have. I mean, you think of the number of events they do attend I wonder how many plaques the Queen and Prince Philip opened in their lifetime. It must have been running into thousands. I always love the story as well. The Queen, all, all, every time the Queen came, that she must be so used to smelling paint <laughs> because everything would be done up for the Queen's arrival. The role of the monarchy in this generation, in this time and the times that go forward, it is definitely changing for, for my, me, my generation, who grew up only knowing Queen Elizabeth II and Prince Charles, as Prince Charles, still get difficulties making that jump after all these years. But the role of na the nature of monarchy is changing, but so too are the questions and the role of what the church is in state as well. And of course, there's a whole integration and recognition of the role of the church and state as well. Yesterday we saw church and state together within the context of England. Not so much Scotland, because the moderator played a part in the role as a service. You see the moderator of the General Assembly, Ian Greenshields, gave the Bible to, to the king, to King Charles. And that was his role because the, the because the Church of England has a more predominant role. Why? Because the Church of England has as its head the monarch. The Queen is the head of the Church of England, or the King is now the head of the Church of England. We believe that Christ is the head of the Church, and therefore there is that disestablishment. And that's the fact of the Church of Scotland, that while the Church of England is the National Church of England, it is an established church. It's part of the framework of government. The bishops are appointed by government. And the bishops sit in the House of Lords on the cross benches as they are known. We don't have bishops in the Church of Scotland. We have some ministers who fancy themselves as bishops. <laughs> and the fact that this is the colour of shirt I've got on this morning is just purely coincidental. Did I tell you his world laughter day? <laughs> Actually, I never thought in that just, you know, just now as I was saying that. It's that this is the bishop's colour, this is bishop's purple. Oops. 
I don't fancy myself as a bishop, can I just say. My run-in with mitres was the name of the ball we used to play football with in the 1970s. That was enough. But the role of the church in England is so much integrated within the context of nationhood. Um, if you think about the school system, for example, the Church of England still runs some of the schools. Church of England schools down, down south. So the Church of England plays such an important role because it is tied in with the role of the state. The Church of Scotland is the national, we are the national church. The clues in the name, the church, the church of Scotland. And when it comes to the General Assembly, which will meet in a few weeks' time in Edinburgh, the Queen, or the, the, the royal family are always represented. There is always a royal representative at the General Assembly. The, uh, ro the King's Royal High Commissioner, as it will be this year. Sometimes the Queen fulfilled that function, sometimes other members of the royal family. Um, I no doubt King Charles at some point will come up and fulfill that as well. And the start of every general assembly on the Saturday, there is a letter read out from King Charles, it will be read out on behalf of King Charles, affirming the rights of the Church of Scotland. Affirming the right of the Church to be the Church of Scotland. And then the Church sends back a response, a response to the royal, the royal letter. And it's an archaic act of the General Assembly. And yet it's such an important thing as well, because that confirms the role of the Church of Scotland, that the monarch is saying to the church, I am guaranteeing you the right to be the national church. So there is this tie-in with the state, and we have the Lord High Commissioner to the General Assembly every year, who sits through some of the debates in the church and fulfills other functions, but is more or less there as an emissary of the monarchy. But I think the monarchy and the church are facing similar problems at the minute, and that is, where do we fit in to a modern society? Is the monarchy still relevant in 21st century Britain? And of course, we as the church are facing that same existentialist question. Is the church still relevant in the 21st century? And it comes back to the very fundamental reality of what Charles declared that he wants his monarchy to be. And that is a monarchy of service. The reading this morning, who do you serve? Caesar or the church or God? Render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, give unto God what is God. That distinction that we live in this duality of worship, working in a normal world, in a human world, but also we live as people of God, serving God and seeking to do what God asks of us, seeking to serve God in whatever way we are called. Charles declares, is declaring in the start of his monarchy, that he sees himself very much as a servant of the people, a servant of the world. He is well known, is he not, for his environmental concerns, amongst others. That sense of service is what should drive us and identify us, that there is still a role for the church as servant. That's the capstone. The capstone is the central stone in any structure that holds everything in place. That's the image that's been given in First Peter, that Jesus is the capstone, the living stone through which everything has its being. And for us, as we are called to serve God, it is to serve God by witnessing the faith, by living the faith. There's no point just giving voice to faith if we don't then live the faith. And so it is easy to say we are here to serve, but then how do we show and witness and provide that sense of service? But that's what we are called to do as a church. It is fundamental to who we are as a church to be the servants of all, to be the servants of the people, to be there to provide the ordinances of religion, that's what the third article, the clarity of the Church of Scotland, sets us out to be as parish churches. Just now, we are going through a painful process in the Church of Scotland as we go through a period 
of reorganization. I've talked about it before. Many, myself included, believe that some of this should have been done years ago. Years ago, but we weren't willing to bite the bullet. We weren't willing to take on some of the problems that it was going to bring. We knew there were too many churches. Only what now is coming to fruition is the fact we don't have enough ministers. Ministers are thin on the ground. <laughs> I just leave that there for you. Did I mention this cake this morning? <laughs> And while we go through the pain of change, I think it brings home another challenge we face is what is our role in today's society? And our role is being increasingly marginalized. We see that over the years. But we still have a role to play. This week, sorry, last week, we fulfilled or finished off doing firm foundations with the primary sevens and the primary schools in this area. And we look at and focus on the values of the high school that the primary school children are going up to. That's a tremendous privilege that we have because we are the national church, because we have got a sense of service and because we see ourselves still having a role in instruction and in guidance and encouragement and one thing that the church is there to give above all else is a message of hope. That's one of the key functions that we have to do. Sometimes it doesn't feel like it when you come in churches. Some churches you go to and you leave the service and you don't feel as though you've been given a message of hope. In fact, you can barely remember what you've been told. Because you switched off after good morning. <laughs> but our message should be a message that counteracts the negativity of the news we hear in our world, in our nation, the world, the negativity of the difficulties people go through, not just with hope by providing thoughts and prayers which are important. One of the fundamental functions of the church is prayer. But it has to be a more practical reality as well of reaching out to people where they are and when they need us to be there for them. And to share with them a message of hope based on the Christ who came to serve, who we witness and to be the servant church built on the grace of God, built on the love and message of Jesus Christ and guided and directed by the Holy Spirit, giving unto Caesar what is Caesar's and giving to God what is God's. That is what we will maintain and seek to do and live the gospel in this place and in many other churches throughout our world, throughout our nation, throughout the Church of Scotland, to remain faithful to that calling of being God's people in this community. So on this coronation weekend, as we recognize the new king, let us also recognize the eternal king the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. And let us seek to be the servant community of faith that we are called to be as the church. And let's share that journey of faith, life, witness, love, and hope. Amen. And thanks be to God. We sing together hymn number... Four, five, six, the tune nun dank it, and four, five, six, Christ is the world's true light.
interests me about what some of the, uh, the, the commentary on the um, coronation yesterday, people have put up photographs of showing public events where very few people have been at. And I think that's the fundamental reality of the fact that things have changed. My mum was of the generation who remembers the coronation and everybody gathered around small TV sets wherever they could because TV was very new, not everybody did the TV at that day. Uh, and so people gathered around the TV, it was black and white, it was the first coronation to be televised. Today, this time, this coronation, I think people are happier to be in their homes, watching themselves in the comfort of their own homes, on big screens, almost as though you're there, rather than gathering. Who would want to gather in Princess Street in Edinburgh when it's seven degrees and raining? <laughs> Let's be honest. And so the nature of how we view things has changed. I think there is a greater degree of apathy towards monarchy, and I also think there's a greater degree of apathy towards the church. And I suppose the challenge that both the church and the monarchy face is to, make, to break down that apathy. To break down that apathy, to make people realise that we've still got a role and a relevance in the 21st century. And that's important. But I did think it was quite interesting, the comments about, oh look, there's nobody there, that shows the monarchy is dying. I don't think it does, when you see the number of people who are still in the mall, and, and followed it, and all that. And, um, some, there was a picture from Edinburgh, and somebody commented there was five people there. Yes, guess most of them were tourists. Maybe they were. But a lot of tourists come into our country because of the pomp and circumstance that is attached to these things. And I think the way we, we utilize and see these events is so different now from what it was that we have to recognize that change is taking place as well. Let's be honest, how many of you watched at home? I wonder if I put this, uh, if we put it on the big screen in the church, I wonder how many of you would have come here or would you have stayed at home? I think most people would have stayed at home because then you've got your own comforts rather than necessarily the idea of being together in congregation. And I think that's one of the other things that we're in danger of losing, and that's been precipitated by COVID. And that is the idea of meeting in congregation, gathering together. I think there's a danger of losing that, um, because we go online more or less now, and Zooms and all that sort of stuff. And I think that's one of the things that we need to try and regain is that sense of community, because it makes us who we are. Here end of the PS. <laughs> <laughs> and will now lead us in our prayers of intercession. As people gathered together with all that we carry, with all of the joys and concerns of our hearts, let us go to God in prayer. Eternal and almighty God, we humbly come before you, knowing that you are the sovereign Lord and master of all. Today we remember that Christ is for us the way and the truth and the life, and through him we come to know you. In that knowledge, we pray for all the nations of our world with all that unites and divides us. We remember the times we get it so wrong and enter into conflict, knowing the destruction that war brings. We know that is not your way, for yours is one of peace. And so we pray for peace among the nations and recognition of each other through a common humanity and with unconditional love, a just and lasting peace that sees truth and life at its heart. We pray for all enduring violence of any kind and all who work for peace and reconciliation. Eternal God, you tell us that we can ask for anything in your name and you will do it according to your will and for your glory. So we are bold to imagine in your presence people in every place striving for understanding and finding ways of living together. Inspired by your way, may we provide for those who lack food, work, or shelter. Inspired by your truth, may we seek justice and bring integrity to public life. Inspired by your life, may we reveal the light of God's presence to all in need, that you would comfort and strengthen them. 
and we take a moment to remember those people and situations that are closest to our own hearts. And on this day after the coronation, we pray for King Charles, the Queen, and the royal family. May your blessing be upon them in the duties that they carry out for the common good throughout our land and abroad. Grant to King Charles the gift of wise leadership and opportunities to influence the protection of our planet. Grant him clarity of vision and the strength to be self-giving and faithful that he would serve with courage and integrity. Everlasting God, before you the generations rise and pass away, and all is seen and nothing is lost. Your word has always been there since the beginning of time. The constant sound of the divine echoing in the beauty of creation, there as a truth to be discovered and rediscovered by each passing generation. And so each day, may your grace be felt once more and your praise be sung anew. May your people share your love with joy and hope and serve all your children as your church. Eternal and almighty God, hear these our prayers in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. There was a lot of firsts yesterday at the coronation. First time female bishops involved in a coronation. First time one of the main roles of the state, the, the sword bearer, was a female MP, um, Penny Mordaunt. And the first time, of course, that a, a monarch has been um, cor going through the coronation with seven living ex-prime ministers. <laughs> Mind you, the turnover, that's quite surprising. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's not as surprising as we think. So, as you may have detected in our hymns this morning, there is a theme. So we finish off that theme with a hymn that reminds us, The Lord is King. We then have the benediction, and our song blessing is, On this day of World Laughter Day, you shall go out with joy. So, hymn 129 from CH4, The Lord is King. <clears throat>
to serve the living God. Go from this place to be the living church. Go from this place to provide and share the good news in word and in deed and by example. Go now with the blessing of God upon you, with the blessing of the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Descend upon and dwell within your heart this day. Remain with you and be with you and all whom you love and share your journey with now and forevermore. Each other, be there for one another, take care of yourselves, and thank you for being you.